So, so far, we have been uh, coding in XC8 sequentially. That is, you have uh, your main function, and then we go by each line of the function. So, for example, I have here my main function. So, the way we read this is that we start with the first line, and then uh, we go towards the last line. So, here we have your this B0 equals to 1, which just makes the RB0 an input pin. You have this C0 equals 0, which makes R0 as an output pin. You have your while loop. And since this is a while loop, uh, actually this is a while one loop, so this is an infinite loop. So your code is stuck inside the while loop. So basically that's how, that's, that's, that is how you would read our uh, main function. Okay, you like you read it line by line and that's also one way to trace your code or to debug your code you trace it from the topmost to the bottom now if that's the case what if we have this kind of situation right here All right so let me just run this one so I have here <coughs> simple LED flasher. So as you can see, you have your eight LEDs flashing from top to bottom. And this is actually the main thing that our code does. Okay. Now what if we want to do something while your main process is executing? Okay, so let's say what if we want your our code to read a uh, button or maybe there's some um, communication from an external device, but let's, let's keep it simple. Let's say you want to read a button while your, or your uh, microcontroller is executing this main routine, right? So if we follow the sequential concept then uh, if your LED is flashing like this one so if I will push this button then uh, your mega controller will not catch it because it's busy actually executing your main process right so as you can see your LED is flashing and if I will press the button in the middle of the process then our mega controller uh, uh, might miss our button press and it takes perfect timing for our microcontroller to catch our button press so let me just show you how it's done, how that's done okay so as you can see I timed my button press when the flashing is at the start that's it that's when this LED it's turned on because that's the top of the program. Okay, so let me try it again. So that's actually what we wanted. Or simply put, we can just hold the button and it will trigger our secondary routine always. But of course, you don't want to just keep the button pressed, right? Okay, so at with, uh, what, what I will actually uh, show you in this video is how to use interrupts. Okay, so I will define what an interrupt first, some definition, some terms about interrupts, and then how we can code interrupt in our C program for our microcontroller right here. Okay, so what is an interrupt? An interrupt is an event that requires the CPU to stop normal program execution and perform some service related to that event. So you can actually define it by its name. It's called an interrupt because it simply interrupts whatever the uh, CPU is currently doing. So the interrupts can be it can be an external interrupt. It can be caused by an out outside circuit or hardware. It could be an internal interrupt, meaning it, the source could be inside the CPU itself. Uh, internal interrupts <coughs> may also be caused 
uh, because of software errors. So those are the, the two general types. So I have here a simple uh, analogy of interrupts. Okay, so the, I, also, I usually do this to explain the concept of interrupts to my students. So let's say you are, uh, let's say we have Carlo right here reading a book, right? Then while Carlo was reading a book, the phone rang. Okay, so usually this is what Carlo or any other boy reading a book would do when there's a phone ringing, right? So remember the page number by, of course, you place a bookmark and uh, you close the book, put it aside. Okay, next thing you pick up the phone, you say hello. Then you listen to the voice over the phone to find out who is calling or ask who is calling if the voice is not familiar. Then you talk to that person. And then you hang up the phone when you finish talking. You go back to your book, turn the page where you place your bookmark and resume reading your book. So basically this is the same thing that happens during an interrupt. So your main process is you reading the book or Carlo reading the book the interrupt is when the phone rang so basically when there's a main process and an interrupt occurs the CPU takes note where in the execution part did the interrupt occurred so actually each line in the code is monitored through what we call a program counter register so during execution domain process, if there's an interrupt, that program counter for that line is recorded in the stack, and then the CPU services or notices the uh, interrupt. Okay, so this is the part where Carlo picks up the phone and says hello, and then it determines which is the source of the interrupt because a microcontroller could have different sources of interrupt, not just one or two, maybe more, right? So this is the part where Carlo listens to the voice or asks the caller who he is so that he can know who is calling or same way, the CPU can know which is the interrupt source. And then you talk to that person or that would be the part wherein the CPU allows the interrupt routine to execute. Then after executing the interrupt routine, you end the routine, the interrupt routine, and we go back to our main process. So that's basically it. Okay, why interrupts? Interrupts are useful because they uh, coordinate I/O activities and preventing the CPU from being tied up during data transfer process. This is actually very true. Uh, most microcontroller projects have more than one task. Okay, for example. Uh, you have a system that listens to multiple devices. You have a single system that has multiple sensors and then it's also connected to the internet, right? So maybe data is coming from the internet in regular intervals and then the, the microcontroller, the system is also busy reading sensor values. So there should be a way for the microcontroller to know if data is coming from the external network and while reading values from the sensor so that's actually coordinating or uh, regulating the tasks handled by your microcontroller uh, second boost it uh, is to help in performing time critical applications so we have actually what we call timer interrupts so timer interrupts trigger in a specific in terms of time, say a second, a minute, an hour, it can be an hour, maybe. So that is an example of time critical applications when you need to do something at a specific interval of time. So of course, you, you can't just do delays for that because the delays might miss depending on where the main process is currently executing. So it's better to just use a timer-based interrupt so that whenever a time, a specific time is reached, then 
that routine would be executed in your code. Third would be uh, provide a graceful way of exit from application when a software error occurs. This is when there is an internal interrupt going. Uh, there's a software error going. So if you would uh, do some uh, interrupt, as I said, this is uh, what we call a watchdog timer interrupt. So maybe more on this on uh, the future videos. This is actually one way of automatically resetting your program so that your error will not have great impact. For example, if you have a kiosk or say, let's say a machine that is constantly on, uh, for example, uh, let's say a prepaid load machine, right? Prepaid load machine, right? So you, you put in money, then you put in your mobile number, and then the machine would send you a prepaid load. Right, so it's constantly on. Customers are constantly using it. But what if, what, what if there's some error inside it, right? So if you're a good programmer, one way to do it is that if there's an error, then your system should automatically reset. Okay? So that at reset, then maybe, maybe that error will not occur again. Right? So that's third uh, reason why we use interrupts. And uh, lastly, interrupts can remind the CPU to perform routine tasks, meaning tasks that are often repeated in a given span of time. For example, keeping track of the time of the day, periodic data acquisition, reading sensors, reading values of sensors for, uh, for example, every hour or so, or so. Task switching in a multitasking operating system is also actually interrupt based. Okay, so for uh, for computers that seemingly operates multiple uh, programs at a time, what happens actually is that it's actually switching between applications, similar to how we did POV in the last video. So it's it's switching between applications, and since the switching is fast enough, then it it looks like it's actually performing multiple tasks at the same time. Actually, it just switching and then if something is if one application is doing something that needs to be uh, or that needs to be done or needs to get the attention of the user then that triggers an interrupt then that is now shown to the user okay so these are the reasons why we normally use interrupts in microcontroller programs now we have what we call uh, interrupt maskability Okay, this is actually uh, a way of masking or unmasking uh, interrupts or the what, another way of saying this is one way of disabling or enabling interrupts. Okay, so most microprocessors and microcontrollers have the option of ignoring interrupts. So if interrupts can be ignored, these are called maskable interrupts. If the interrupt is very important that the CPU cannot ignore it, it's called non-maskable interrupt. Um, another uh, definition we have is a pending interrupt. This is an interrupt where it, it, it's active, it's triggered, but it's not it's serviced by the CPU. Okay, so we call that a pending interrupt. So there are important interrupts that cannot be ignored by the CPU. So if they trigger, they're always serviced. There are also an inter interrupts that can be disabled or can be ignored by the CPU, so we call this maskable interrupts. And also what we call interrupt priority. So there are multiple interrupt sources. You can, we can also service an interrupt based on priority, meaning who should come first. So, um, of course, interrupts with high priority I serviced before interrupts with low priority. Uh, many microprocessors and microcontroller units prioritize hardware interrupts before software interrupts. And uh, most in most microprocessors and microcontrollers, interrupt priority is non-programmable. Okay. Uh, it actually the interrupt priority is de is depend uh, depends on the microcontroller model. So we will uh, maybe I can discuss that later. Um. For um, our device, we don't have actually 
interrupt priority, I'm talking about the peak season of 8778. It doesn't have an interrupt priority. It follows what they call an interrupt vector. So the routines are placed in that vector. So every time there's an interrupt, then the, whatever the routine is in that vector is executed. Uh, some models, maybe more advanced models, have what you call a priority. Wherein, if you give it this one, this uh, interrupt high priority, then it triggers first before the other one, which is a lower priority. For our device, we don't have priority, so whatever source triggers that interrupt, then it's executed. It's up to the user to check if a specific interrupt is triggered. So how do you check that? It's actually based on the interrupt plug, which later we'll discuss. Okay, so I keep saying about executing interrupts. So the term for that is actually an interrupt service. Okay, so you have your main routine, an interrupt triggers, then the CPU determines the source of the interrupt, and then it goes to that source, or it goes to the routine that needs to be done for the interrupt to stop, right? So we call that that routine the interrupt service, ISR, or interrupt service routine. Okay, so after the ISR is done, then the CPU resumes normal program execution. Okay, so how can the CPU stop the execution of program and resume it late? So as I mentioned earlier, you have your main process and then an the interrupt occurred. The CPU takes note of the program counter value for that process or for that line of code. Okay, it puts it on a stock and it serves the interrupt and if the interrupt is done, then it trades the stock and gets the program counter back so that it can assume to whatever it was doing before the interrupt occurred. Okay, so generally this is what we call the interrupt service or this is how we describe the interrupt service cycle for Epic system F877A. Okay, you save the program counter value. Okay, this is similar to uh, keeping the uh, putting a bookmark in the book. You save the CPU status in the stock, but this is not true for all. So this uh, this is all optional in some microcontroller units and microprocessors. Identifying the source of the interrupt. This is equivalent to asking who was who the caller is, or identifying it based on the voice. Uh, resolving the starting address of the corresponding ISR. Okay, uh, executing the ISR, restoring the CPU status from the stock, restoring the PC from the stock, and resuming the interrupted program. So this is the interrupt service cycle. So this is an eight-step process. Now for the interrupt vector, I mentioned the interrupt vector earlier. So this is like a pointer as to where the program should go if ever there's an interrupt. So that's a, we call that an interrupt vector. So this is actually the starting address of the interrupt service routine. Uh, it can be determined in three ways. It depends on which brand or model of microcontroller you have. It can be predefined. Okay, for so all microchip and AT51 microcontroller units use predefined interrupt vectors. Including our, of course, Peak 16 a It has a predefined interrupt vector. It's actually a 0x04, but if you're coding in C, in that assembly, you don't actually need uh, to know about the interrupt vector. So it's actually useful in assembly, but not in C, because the interrupt vector is already uh, defined somewhere internally in the code. So we don't. The user does not really need to define the interrupt vector. Uh, second way is to fetch the vector from a predefined memory location. It's actually this location is called the interrupt vector table. So Motorola microcontrollers use this. Basically, you have a table somewhere in the memory, and in that table is listed all the interrupt sources. So if an interrupt is triggered, the CPU looks at the table and then goes to whatever or whichever point in the program the entry of the table points. The third way, the last way, is um, there is an interrupt acknowledge cycle. 
that fixes a vector number in order to locate the interrupt vector. So when a CPU performs a read by cycle, the source of the interrupt gives an interrupt vector number. This vector number tells the CPU the address of the interrupt vector. So this is how Intel processors or processors uh, read or determine the interrupt vector. Okay, so for programming, what the register that we need to manipulate in order to use registers is the INCON register. It's, uh, I think it's short for interrupt control register. So it's actually located in four banks, but in C, we don't need to know about the address of the INCON register anymore. So same, to, same with other registers, this is actually an 8-bit register. Okay. So, what's in this register are the enable bits and the flag bits for the different interrupt sources. Okay, so you have your MSB, your bit 7. This is the bit GIE. This is the global interrupt enable bit. This is actually your master switch for all the interrupts. So, before you can use any other interrupt sources, you need to uh, set this one up. You make this bit 1 so that all unmasked interrupts are enabled. If this is zero, then all the other interrupt, interrupts will not be usable. Okay, so first things first, before you can use interrupt, is that you need to set this bit. Okay, or make this high, this bit high. Okay, so for our example right here, we'll be using the external interrupt. External interrupt. So the external interrupt is uh, something that happens or an interrupt that occurs when this pin right here goes from high to low or low to high or just simply put if there's a change of state involved in this pin if you go back to the pin up of your 877a this pin rb0 slash int is actually rb0 okay so in my circuit right here i connected a uh, button on this pin connected the button in this pin so whenever there is if whenever I push this button then the state of the pin changes and that triggers our interrupt okay so this only this this interrupt this type of interrupt only occurs on this pin okay rb0 slash interrupt pin okay so going back to enable the interrupt on that pin I just need to set bit 4 of the encode register or set uh, INTE bit. So if I will uh, set this one, then that enables the interrupt on RB0. And with the enable bit for the RB0 in interrupt is the flag bit. So basically, when you see flag bit, this is the indicator if the interrupt occurred. So if the interrupt occurred on the RB0 pin, then the flag bit, this bit right here, bit 1, will set or will go to high if it's not triggered then it will remain low okay so basically that's how you enable an interrupt of course you stick you have other social interrupt okay but for this video i will only cover the external interrupt bit or the external interrupt source okay so this is our code for uh, this circuit okay so let me just show you the code uh, the output of this code first so again I have eight LEDs and uh, this LEDs flashing would be our main process so I have here two buttons to show you the difference between a uh, button with an interrupt and a button without an interrupt as I'm showing you earlier I will press this button in the middle of the process then it will not trigger or it will not do my second process but if i if i time it at the beginning or when the d1 led is turned on then it can trigger my second process or i can also just hold press and hold the button and it will always trigger my second process okay so this is a button without an interrupt now what happens if I will uh, press this button that's wired on the interrupt pin. So look at it. I look at this one. Okay, so no matter where the main process is currently executing, it will always trigger my second 
routine or my second process. So that's the beauty of an interrupt. It will always interrupt the main process just to execute the second process, which is this thrashing uh, of all LEDs. Okay, so this is my code right here. This is actually the short code. Okay. So uh, besides my main routine, I have three other routines. I have enable external interrupt, set up ports, and have my flash LEDs. Okay. So the enable ex external interrupt is just a uh, function to enable or the global interrupt course, the global interrupt bit, if you recall this one. So I set this, I equate this to one. And my external interrupt bit. Okay? So this function, again, enables the interrupt that I want to use, which is the external interrupt. Okay? So this is called on the very first line on my main routine. Okay? By the way, when you would see uh, for C, you actually need a function prototype before the main routine so that it can uh, tell you that there's actually a function that has this name somewhere in the code. Okay, and this is required for C programming, not so much for Arduino programming. Okay, so you can see there's there's a prototype, but there's actually the, the actual function right here. All right. So that's enable external interrupt. My setup ports function is just a function that sets up the pin used in my circuit. So if you can look back again to the circuit, we have switches or buttons on RB0 and RC0. That means our test B0 and test C0 should be 1 to indicate that they are input pins. So that's what happened right here. And then since I've wired 8 LEDs to port D, then all port D are output, that means my test D is equal to 0. Okay? So that makes all port D pins output pins. So, basically that's it for setup ports. And this is called after the enable external interrupt routine or function. And then, for our infinite loop, our while loop, this is where our main process is done. So I have this part right here. This actually checks RC0. This is the button without an interrupt. So if you press that button, okay, if you press this button, this actually makes the pin RC0 grounded. So that means I need to equate this or check if this is equal to 0 to check if it's pressed. So if it's pressed, then it will call on my flash flash leads uh, function which is right here so this is the function where all the LEDs are flashing so basically just the for loop this is um, this is the part where all the LEDs are off a 200 millisecond delay then all the LEDs are on then another delay and there this goes on for uh, four times I think from 0 to 3 or no, three times, zero to two, okay? And uh, this occurs if you press a button at RC0, okay? Of course, if you don't press, it goes to the main routine. So this is what happens without an interrupt, right? So since your button checking is at the top, okay? So you need to do, you need to really time the, the press while your loop is currently at the top bottom a uh, top portion of your code so if your for example your code is here in the middle of the main routine then it will not trigger okay so what happens in the main routine is that I actually used uh, a math function a power function so that's why I included the math.h header right here. Okay, there's a lot of other headers for the XC8, by the way. So you can check out the uh, the XC8 manual for other functions. But basically, all uh, almost all basic C, func C headers are included in XC8. So I include math.h so that I can use pow, the pow function. So the pow function actually 
takes a base number and then the exponent of that uh, base. So if you can see, I have a for loop right here, and this loop goes from 0 to 7, okay? So what this does is it starts with j equals 0, of course, and that would be 2 raised to 0, and that's equal to 1. So if port d equals to 1, that is when the first LED is on. Now this LED is on because that is when port d equals to 1. That is actually reading it like a binary number, okay? So this is your LSB, this is your least significant bit, this is your most significant bit. So if port d equals to 1, then this pin is the only one that is high, then d1 is on, okay? Then, continuing with the loop, j becomes 1, so you have 2 raised to 1, that's 2. So in binary, that means this bit, or uh, rd1 now, or this, uh, LED D2 is now on. Then you continue up till you reach this, uh, the last LED, which is D8. So basically, uh, this part right here is producing numbers 1, 2, 4, uh, 8, 16, uh, 32, 64, and 1, 2, 8. Okay, this is uh, this part is producing these numbers and um, in binary form these values are equivalent to uh, d1 when, when you're equal to 1 okay so when port equals to 1 this one is on when port d equals to 2 this one is on when port uh, d equals to 4 this d3 is on when uh, uh, equals to uh, 1, 2, 4, 8, if it equals to 8, port equals to 8, d4 is on, and so on, until port equals to 1, 2, 8, then that's the time when d8 is on. Okay, and of course this goes on because this for loop is inside the while loop. Okay, so that's basically how I did the main loop. Of course you can do the the same for loop, the same pair way, where you can just do it like this, port d equals to uh, 0b, 0, okay, then you assign a delay in between, and then, okay, for example, like this one, okay, you assign a delay in between, then you move the 1 in the binary digit right here, one place to the left, so just that, so you move it one place to the left, then you continue until this one go, uh, reaches the, the MSB. So this actually has a similar output with this part right here. But of course, this one is shorter compared to this one. So this, I'm just sharing you one way of flashing LEDs from uh, the top to bottom, from the LSB to MSB. Okay, so that's the main routine. So what happens here is that uh, since my interrupt is enabled, okay, since my interrupt is enabled, if the interrupt occurred, or if I press the button on RB0, then my CPU will service my ISR. So this is now my ISR right here. My interrupt service routine. So actually, for my ISR, my interrupt service routine, is actually just similar to my flash LEDs routine. So it's similar, very similar. It's the same actually. The only difference is that I have to check if the, the enabled bit for my external interrupt and the flag bit are both set. Okay, so because as I mentioned, the interrupt will trigger with which, whichever is the source of the interrupt. So to check if it's the, actually the external interrupt that triggers it or the interrupt at RB0 that triggers it, I need just to check if the enabled pin uh, the bit and the flag bit are set. If that's case, if that's the case, if they are both set, then it's confirmed that that uh, bit triggers it or that pin triggers it, then I can just execute my all flash routine. Of course, before I, I, I'm I done with the ISR, I need to clear the flag because it doesn't clear automatically, then just do a return so that it can go back to the main routine. I have another circuit here. 
so we just run this one okay so i have a dual seven segment common cathode and as you can see it displays two digits right now it's zeros so if i press the button then it increments the display number so this is of course from zero zero to nine 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 for two ninety nine i mean All right so as you can see the button is still on the external interrupt pin rb0 okay and i have the seven segment connected to port d so for this example project my i actually don't have main process which of course is possible so if, i will show the code to you so let me just tap it the code is this one all right so this one uses another interrupt so this one besides the external interrupt uses the timer interrupt so i actually uh created the function named enable timer interrupt it 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 requires a parameter a prescale value so a prescale is a value that you can um, make which you can make the timer uh, run slower or faster so more or less later so basically i have a function here and it's run after the enable external interrupt so this is the function right here okay so similar to uh, the enable external interrupt inside the enable timer interrupt is i have my gi equals to one okay actually yeah if enable external interrupt was the first one to be uh, turned on then you don't need je equals to one but just for portability sake i just added the enable bit here so that if ever someone will use this code you can uh, call whichever of these two first okay but if going with j equals to one for both functions will not do something about your code so it's, it's okay so you can still do that so for this one uh we need a new bit from the encode register we call this bit the timer interrupt enable bit so this is d0 ie Goes to one so this enables the timer interrupt then uh, for these two lines here there's a bit more explanation to do so you, the 877a our microcontroller has timers it actually has three timers okay so if you go if you look at the uh, data sheet of your uh, microcontroller right so it, ha it has a timer zero a timer one and a timer two so what timer does is actually it runs in the background depending on the size of the timer it counts from zero to a certain number so the timer uh, zero is a timer uh, it's an 8-bit timer so that means it counts from zero to two five five okay because it's 8-bit so when you say two five five uh where did where did eight bit come from where did two five five come from so let me just show you my calculator so if it, it says eight bit that means your starting is or your maximum value would be two raised to eight right it's actually two five six but since you always start at zero therefore your counting is from zero to two five five okay so that's what the timer does it comes from zero to two five five and everything runs in the background now how fast is the is the time between each count so normally normally the time for each count is equal to the instruction cycle so if we recall the instruction cycle the formula for the instruction cycle is four divided by your frequency of your oscillator so for our uh, code which uses an uh, crystal frequency of 4 million and 4 megahertz right so our instruction cycle is 4 divided by 4 million 4 million yeah? 4 million so it should be yeah, 4 million so that's about instruction cycle of one microsecond so that means the timer runs for uh, two 155 counts of one microsecond each count that means it runs at 
255 microseconds. Yeah, 255 microseconds. So it overflows. Okay, it overflows at after 255 microseconds. It's actually quite fast. That's in microseconds, right? So that means that your timer interrupt, okay, your timer interrupt, it's, if it's enabled, then it will trigger every 255 microsecond. Okay? So 255 microseconds is quite fast. But you have a way to reduce this rate using what we call prescaler. So in our uh, data sheet right here, we have a table, and this table is actually on a new register. This is an option uh, reg register. So the option reg register is a register which controls some characteristics of our timer, uh, timers, timer zero in particular. Okay, so there are actually a lot of bits here, but the only thing that we are interested in for this topic is the bits two to zero, which is the prescaler rate select bits. All right, so if you can see in the table. Right, so we have a bit volume here, and you have your timer zero right here. So we just ignore the watchdog timer rate for now. So for the timer zero rate, as you can see, as the bit values increase from zero to seven, again, okay, it's in binary, right? So your timer rate also increases. So at zero, 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 your timer rate is one is to two. Okay, that means your rate is twice that of your 255 microsecond rate okay then uh, that means if your bits 2 to 0 of the option register is 0 0 0 then your timer 0 overflows at twice this value right here which is around I think uh, 510 microseconds okay and if you go further you will reach up to 1 is to 256 this is the last rate that you can have and this would be the slowest rate and that would be equal to 255 times 256 microsecond or that would be let me just okay that's 255 microseconds so that's 65 milliseconds all right so at PS2 to PS0, your timer zero rate is at two at six around six point five milliseconds. This means that at this prescale value, your timer zero overflows after six point five milliseconds. Okay, or, or putting it in the interrupt concept. Your interrupt will, will trigger every 6.5 milliseconds. Yeah, so that's the timer interrupt. Now going back to the code, what I did here is that on my interrupt service routine, remember this is the function that triggers when there's an interrupt. Since I'm now using two interrupt sources, okay, one is the external interrupt, right? The other would be the timer interrupt, right? So what happens in the external interrupt is that if every time this button is pressed okay the external interrupt trigger so what it does is it increments a variable once and then it checks the value of once if it's greater than nine then it increments another variable tens and then checks again if the tens is greater than nine if it does it it increase uh, sets tens to zero so why once in tens because if you look at our schematic right here if you have two digits the left digit would be the tens the right digit would be the ones right so that's how you count this how our decimal system works so if your ones reaches a value beyond nine it goes back to zero but then your tens it increases by one right when you have your ones in the tens the tens is in the left the ones in the right so every time we push this button okay your ones increment then if it reaches a value beyond nine it increments tens and so on until it reaches 99 so basically if it reaches 99 then according to my code 
our value in the seven segment display resets back to zero. So that's the first interrupt source. That's through the external interrupt. The second interrupt is the timer interrupt. So what I did here is that the uh, switching between two seven segment values or two seven segment displays are done through timer interrupt. So if you recall in my topic about seven segment displays, the way to handle two seven segment displays with only one port right here as you can see both segments are actually a board displays are actually connected to one port the way to handle this one is that you need just to uh, alternately on and off these two so if one is on and the other one is off and so on so basically if the left uh, digit is on then you pass the, the tens value to port d if the right digit is on you pass the ones value to port d so that's what we covered on our last video. Okay, so for the code, what I did here is every time the timer interrupt, which is according to our calculation is 65 milliseconds, right? 65, is that right? One, two, oh no, six, yeah, it's 65. It's wrong, it's actually not 6.5, but 65 milliseconds. So at, six, at a rate of 65 milliseconds, what happens here is the, uh, the RC0 and the RC1 states are switch or if rc0 is one it becomes zero then thirdly if rc0 equals to one rc1 equals to one okay and uh, if that's not the case then you just up, up invert the polarity again of both rc0 and rc1 so this is the part where the left digit and the right digits are alternately turning on and off and uh, this is also the part where I pass the value of the tens and the ones on the port D. So I actually borrowed the function from my previous video. I had this the number to segment function, which is this one. So basically, what this function does is that it returns the uh, super segment binary equivalent of every number that we need to display. It has all numbers from zero to nine. Okay, then you just pass a number it, right here and it. Uh, gives back the binary equivalent value of the seven segment display. So basically, if I pass it a number like nine, then it converts it to a value so that it can display nine on the seven segment display. Okay, so this is the uh, timer interrupt part. Okay, so this is the part where we are displaying a value on the seven segment display. This is the part where we increment the value on that seven segment display. So what's inside my main? Actually, if you look at my main routine, it doesn't have anything. Okay, so if that's the case, we can expand this project. We can make the microcontroller do other things besides uh, displaying digits on a seven-segment display or waiting for a button press, right? Because both of those things are handled using interrupts. Okay, so we go back to our circuit. All right, so again, the display of the digits is handled by timer interrupts, which is triggered every 65 milliseconds. Okay, then uh, this button press is handled by the external interrupt. And we have no main routine actually, so we can just add something to our main routine to handle it. Okay, so that's basically it for both external and timer interrupts.